and welcome back to the Miraculous Mamas podcast. I'm your host, Elizabeth Joy, and we believe in empowering women through storytelling and education. Last week, we had on the Formula Mom and had such an amazing conversation. I learned a lot and I hope that you did as well. I hope you feel empowered in however you are choosing to feed your child. Uh, This week, we are launching Infertility Awareness, uh, Fertility Awareness Month a little bit early with Samantha Bush. She has an incredible, incredible story about um, her fertility struggles and and the struggles that she's been on for years and, and just how it's continued. And I'm super excited to see um, where her story goes because she just has so much going on. Um, and, and she's just doing so much in that world to help others be able to have children. So uh, I just have so much respect from, for her. We had an amazing conversation. I hope you guys, I guess this weekend's Easter, this coming weekend's Easter. So we're going to go ahead and say happy Easter if you celebrate that. Uh, if you're traveling, be safe. And uh, this is the first year that I've actually given anything up for Lent and followed through. So... I'm going to brag on myself really quick because I'm super proud of myself. Uh, I gave up sugar and I gave up TV during the day uh, because sometimes I would just, you know, while I'm nursing Jovi, folding laundry, whatever it may be, turn on the TV and just kind of have it playing in the background while I'm getting some stuff done. But it has forced me to listen to audiobooks and uh, maybe some sermons and podcasts or music. And I really wanted to get back into doing that. Because like years ago, I never even owned a TV and I hardly ever watched it. So I don't know what happened, <laughs> but uh, then then I started to. So um, for me, it was just, yeah, something that I really wanted to to pursue and try. So I've done really, really well. I've barely had any sugar, so I have cheated a couple of times. But um, and and I'm I'm. Let me redefine that quick. I gave up like processed sugar, so like desserts, cookies, cakes, sweets, that types of things. I'm still having some honey in my tea and fruit and um, more natural forms, I guess. Um, I don't know if I could ever give up fruit. And when people say fruit is a sugar, I just disagree. Yes, it does have sugar in it, but then there's so many health benefits. So it's not like the processed refined sugar. So anyways, um, I am just proud of myself because every single time I have this mental struggle, every time I'm like, okay, I'm going to give this up. I do the opposite. Same with like working out. I'll start working out again and I'm like, okay, I'm going to work out five days a week. And then on the sixth day, I'm doing yoga. And then I'm like, I don't work out for weeks then because it's overwhelming. And I do the same with, I'm going to cut all of these things out. And then instead I'll binge on it. And I'm like, why am I self-sabotaging myself? Uh, So I'm just proud of myself that I've stuck to it, that I've done great. And I'm just realizing that I can't be so extreme all the time, even with working out. Like right now I'm telling myself, okay, if two to three times a week, I can do a 15, 20 minute bike ride on the Peloton, then I'm doing great and maybe go for a couple of walks. So two to three times a week is doable. When I tell myself five days a week, I, I'm i not there yet and I feel overwhelmed. And then I end up not doing anything because I get paralysis by analysis. I think of everything I have to do and and then I do nothing. Um, so I'm just learning slow and steady wins the race for me. I've been working out two to three times a week for a few weeks now and I feel really good and I feel good with my workouts. I'm not feeling like, oh, I should be doing more or, um, you know, like, yeah, I'd love to work out more, but I feel great and I'm not... I literally work out for like 20 minutes, two or three times a week and and it has made a difference. So baby steps and I'm realizing that that's how I function. Whereas there's other people that don't function that way. Some people, they have to do cold turkey, balls to the wall to get things done. And I just have so much respect for you. And I thought I was that person and I'm not. I had to be like, okay, I'm going to work out one day a week. I'm going to work out two days a week. Okay, two to three days a week. And I'm good. I did something, you know, for myself this week. 
So anyways, um, I'm going to be traveling with a baby next weekend. So that'll be a first going on an airplane. And I'm really nervous because I know how my ears feel when I land. When I land other places, it feels okay. But it's really weird when I'm landing back into Chicago, my ears feel like they're going to explode. I feel like there are is blood coming out of them. They hurt so bad. So I'm so nervous to fly with a baby because if her ears hurt and there's just nothing you can do, I'm going to nurse her. I'm going to try to do everything I can, but I just, those little ears, I hope that they're okay. So send me some traveling mercies. Um, We're going to Texas to see my family, my sister's kids and husband haven't met Jovi yet and she'll be seven months. So they're really excited to to see her. And obviously we didn't travel for a long time because of everything going on in the world. And we're just feeling more confident in that as, as the numbers are down and it's warming up and a lot of, a lot of other things. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing that experience with you guys. I'm glad that I've interviewed some people on it. Last year I interviewed the traveling child and she had a lot of tips and information. So, uh, and the Duna, the Duna car seat stroller is like a lifesaver. So I'm super glad that we have that. Um, but yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. Vito's coming with me. So I, I have him as well. Uh, but yeah, I'm super excited for you guys to hear this week's episode with Samantha Bush. And I hope that you had an amazing March. You guys were three months into the year. We're almost on our fourth month. Oh my gosh. Uh, so take some some time to breathe it in, be present with your family, be present um, with whatever's going on in your life because this year's already a quarter over. And so it's it time really does fly by. This episode is sponsored by Apostrophe, a prescription skincare company for people that are ready to take their skincare needs seriously. Prescription acne treatment really works and it can be hard to get. You can also have to take time off work and see a doctor, sit in line at a pharmacy for your medications until apostrophe. Apostrophe makes it easy to see a board certified dermatologist online. You'll get uh, treated immediately and your medications are delivered right to your door. All you do is simply fill out Apostrophe's online questionnaire about your skin. You send in some snapshots of yourself and wait for your dermatologist to get back to you. The best part is that they offer topical and oral medications so you can treat your skincare needs from the inside out. And I used it for my rosacea actually on my cheeks. So I've dealt with it came kind of came out of nowhere. So I get melasma on my upper lip and then rosacea. So my skin tone has just been completely uneven for probably seven years now. Um, and so it's something that I've been really self-conscious about and I've tried a lot of different things. And so I decided to get a prescription for it and it was super easy to just send in the pictures on apostrophe and have them get back to me and me be like, yeah, that sounds like a good skincare plan. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's, it's really cool how they have it set up. Um, and then they send it in this cute little box that I get, that I got and, um, a poster card to tell me like how to use it and what to do. Uh, and it's actually been working. I'll have to show you guys a a photo on, on Instagram. So right now you guys can get $15 off your first visit with a board certified dermatologist at apostrophe.com slash mamas and use our code mamas. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash mamas and click begin visit, then use the code mamas at sign up and you'll get $15 off your dermatology visit. That's A-P-O-S-T-R-O-P-H-E dot com slash mamas and use code mamas to get your dermatology visit for $15 off. And we thank Apostrophe for sponsoring the podcast. All right, we're going to jump into the interview with Samantha. All right, everyone. I have Samantha Bush here and I'm super excited to talk to her. She is the author of Fighting Infertility uh, and she is an advocate for IVF. She's here to share her story with us. Um, You guys may recognize her from Instagram or her husband's on the race 
the racetracks. I know I was talking to my brother-in-law before this. He goes, he's a huge um, NASCAR fan. So I was like, do you know this guy? And he's like, yeah, why? I was like, because I'm interviewing his wife. He's like, no way. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Of course. I'm super excited. Yeah. So I'd love for you just to kind of share with everybody who you are and uh, what made you write a book. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, Well, the book has been many years in the making, to be honest with you. Um, So Kyle and I, to give you a little bit of background, we met, um, I was going in my senior year of college. um, And so, gosh, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. So we've been together for quite a while. Um, And you know how it is. You start dating and then we got married. And then um, he was in racing. So we were kind of traveling the country, having so much fun. And then, you know, like one set of friends starts having kids and more sets of friends. And it kind of let us be like, okay, you know, are we ready? Um, And we always knew we wanted to have kids, but gosh, we were still so young. I think I was like 25, 26, you know? And, and so I just thought, you know, I'm healthy. He's healthy. Okay. We're ready. And, um, all my friends around us, I kid you not just, you know, Oh, Hey, we're trying. Oh, Hey, we're pregnant. Oh, we got pregnant the first month. Or, you know, one of my friends was like, it's, it's been three months and like, I just can't believe it. And then the next month she was pregnant. So everybody around me, that was kind of their story. So I went into it completely, you know, naive, completely just full of excitement and hope. And, um, so we started trying right away and it was, you know, fun and exciting. It almost feels like the honeymoon all over Mm -hmm. again. Um, and you know, I wasn't really worried one month went by two months, three months. Um, I had been on birth control for quite a while. So I was like, Oh, you know, what everybody says, it has to get out of your system and all that. And I was like, okay, I'm not worried. Um, and then a few more months went by and I would say right around six months, um, which for those listening, understand that six months is more like six years. I think when you're trying to have a child, um, I was like, okay, maybe I should start looking at like why, why this isn't happening. And so of course I started Googling it and, um, I really wasn't comfortable really asking a lot of my friends or, or talking about it. Um, and to date myself even more, this was like 2013. So Instagram wasn't what Instagram is today. Um, so I just didn't have a lot of resources except for the internet. And so, you know, I was reading different things, like try the ovulation kits and I was doing that. And I was like, well, it seems like I'm ovulating all the time. This thing's always smiling at me. I'm (laughs) kind of confused. So, um, you know, we just, we went down that road for a while and it became, really hard. Um, Really, it it went from being fun and exciting to being just really sad and really depressing and really isolating. Um, I remember kind of calling my OBGYN and and she was like, oh, it hasn't been a year. You're fine. And I'm like, I I really think something might be off. Uh, My periods were all over the place, came and go as they pleased. Um, I was breaking out, my hair was falling out. And I was just like, I feel like something's wrong. Um, but I didn't, I was speaking up, but I, I now see, I wasn't speaking up enough. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, I really need you to actually see me. Um, and cause I kept getting, I felt like blown off. Like they were like, Oh, you know, just keep trying. Um, at one point, I was told to drink more water. <laughs> um, Cause that'll get uh, you pregnant. Like, okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Um, and so as finally close to a year, I, I thought maybe I was miscarrying. I wasn't sure what was happening, but I was bleeding a lot. And I finally was like, okay, somebody needs to see me. Like I need a real doctor's appointment. And so finally they're like, okay, we'll run the tests. And, and, um, right away as they did the ultrasound, they're like, oh, you have PCOS, just very like mm-hmm. casual. And, um, I was like, okay, what? And instantly, I feel like when you hear, you know, a big long name with syndrome at the end, I'm mm-hmm. like, oh my God, I'm dying, right? Like what's, what's happening? Um, and then I kind of, st- I had never heard about it. So I started researching what PCOS was and found that I feel, and I still feel to today that it's kind of like this blanket term, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And then there's so many different aspects and almost levels to PCOS that I almost wish they would redefine it, if that makes sense, you know? Um, so anyways, they, sorry, they put me on Clomid. Mm-hmm. 
not fun. Um, in the book, I have a whole chapter called the Clomid crazies because that was probably out of all the fertility meds I've ever been on the worst. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced Clomid. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to joke that I was basically certifiably crazy during that time. I, you just couldn't control it. Mm-hmm. I was happy. I was sad. I was crying. I was all over the place. And so after five cycles of that, because they were for sure, they're like, Oh, this is why you didn't get pregnant. We'll put you on this. Everything will be fine. After five cycles, they're like, we, we don't know what to do with you anymore. You need to go to a fertility clinic. So now we're almost like 16 months into this. And I remember we get to the fertility clinic and they said, um, basically like, Oh, you forgot to send over your husband's paperwork. And he was there with me. And I was like, well, he doesn't have paperwork. It's me. And they're like, wait, 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 wait where's his like sperm sample paperwork and, and labs? And I was like, they, they never told us to do them. We didn't know, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so we quickly found out he also had an issue, a uh, male factor. So they mm-hmm. basically ruled out IUI for us. Um, and so we had to go straight to IVF with ICSI. We will return to this interview right after this quick ad break. I want to talk to you about Love Every. They are the play kits that are designed by experts for your child's developing brain. And you can feel confident giving your child the best start with a convenient plan for playtime. And they deliver a play kit for your child's exact learning stage so that they have the right toys at the right time. Uh, One reason why I sign up for Love Every right after (laughs) I had Jovi uh, was because I... As, like I know a lot about birth as a doula, but as far as kids go, I really don't know anything. And I didn't know what, what she should be playing with, what she should be learning, um, when certain milestones were supposed to be happening. And I wanted to make sure that she was getting toys that were age appropriate, um, but also just like a support system for her family so that she would, so that we didn't have to think about it and that I knew she was getting things to stimulate her brain growth and to be able to play with. And so I signed up super early on. We've been getting them since she was a newbie. Um, and you get the toy, right toys at the right time every two to three months. And uh, Love Every did all the research for me. The play kits are filled with play things and activities that were designed by experts and they link brain science and Montessori philosophy to the way that the kids play. Um, also, I like that it, they're very min, like minimalistic and simple toys, um, but yet she plays with them all the time. Your kids don't need tons of clutter and chaos to learn and to have fun and grow Um, even the, she still plays with the toys that she got from her first boxes. Like she absolutely loves it. I also love that it comes with just like conversation starters, things to talk to your baby about. And, um, her last one had a book about learning the body parts and a ball, a fun ball and, uh, just different things to help with cognitive learning and, um, she, it's always fun to, uh, open it every single month. And cause I'm learning what she should be learning. I'm like, Oh, she's going to learn how to do this soon. And this toy is going to help her learn hand eye coordination. And it's just super exciting. Uh, and there's tons of testimonials. I'm going to read a couple, um, of what parents have said. It has been such a relief to receive these beautiful age appropriate toys. It gives me such peace of mind, especially as a first time mother to be able to provide my son with developmentally appropriate toys. Love these kits. One of the best baby purchase designs to date. And right now we have a discount for you guys. You can activate free content tailored to your child's age and get a peek inside the play kits at Love Every's website. Visit dot com slash mamas to get started. That's dot com slash mamas to get started. Now back to the episode. Everything you're sharing so good. I love what you were saying about the PCOS though too, because I've even interviewed people about PCOS and I feel like I'm still confused on it. It's like this, like you said, a blanket term that could mean so many different things. Exactly. Because I was like, oh, I'd have cysts, you know, on my ovaries. And they're like, no, 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 no. You just produce a lot of follicles. But some people have cysts in their ovaries. I'm Mm -hmm. like, well, but I'm, and to this day, I'm like, I really feel like we need to do some work on categorizing 
the different types of PCOS in order to help people understand them and, and also different supplements and different things naturally that help women like get a grasp on their symptoms. Um, I would love to share this. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to eat processed soy. Mm -hmm. So I don't eat a lot of meat. My diet was always made up of like um, those veggie burgers, all soy. So when I cut out soy from my diet, my hair stopped falling out. My skin started clearing up a bit. Um, So there's so many natural things like taking zinc and different things that help. And, And now that's being discussed a little bit more in certain you know, through social and and through some doctors, but I don't feel like it's talked about enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because if I've learned anything, I'm I'm really learning that supplements and a holistic approach along with IVF really helps make, I think, the IVF process easier. Um, But I can jump into that or I could go back to where we were. Yeah, no, I I definitely want to talk about that. Um, I just want to go back to the Clomid really quick because I can't imagine... Already the stress that you were under trying to conceive or trying being like, something's not right. Something's not right. And then they finally listen to you. You find out you have this syndrome and then they're like, we'll take this. This is going to work for you. And then you start feeling crazy while you're on it already under all of the stress and still not getting pregnant. Like that just sounds like such a hard time. Yeah, it was, um, it was a really very sad, I would probably say, I was very depressed. Um, I didn't really come to terms with it. But looking back now, I stopped wanting to be with my friends as much. Um, I stopped wanting to go out because inevitably either somebody was going to be pregnant, somebody Mm -hmm. was going to have a baby, or somebody was going to ask us why we weren't having kids. And it was really hard. And the book kind of started back then. I started journaling. Um, I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. I didn't feel like you know, eight years ago, there were all these apps and support groups and, and social media groups. Um, so it it was a really lonely time. And, you know, I, I was just so, I guess, confused and, and ashamed and just felt like something was just wrong with me. And it was really hard and it took all the joy out of, you know, trying to have a baby. Um, And so a lot of people said, like, how were you with IVF? And I said, honestly, it was an answer. Finally, it Mm was. So for us, after just kind of, I feel like free falling for so long, it was a concrete, like, here's what you can try. And so that was actually nice for us. I mean, I felt like the whole process was difficult now going through it a second time. I feel like it's so much easier because of all the amazing resources in this community, um, but just having a, a definitive action step to do was nice back then. Um, so yeah, in 2014, we went through our first egg retrieval and it went really well. Um, you know, we had embryos to choose from. We implanted our son Brexton, got pregnant right away, had a healthy pregnancy, a healthy baby boy, and um, everything was amazing. And Then when we went to go try for a second one, I walked into it just full of confidence and like, okay, you know, we've done all the things statistically, like it is on our side percentage wise to get pregnant. And so this was uh, 2018. And so, you know, social media was a lot bigger. Instagram was a lot bigger. And I decided... um, you know, I want to bring everybody along on this journey so that couples getting ready to do this can see everything and nothing's going to be a surprise because I'm going to document everything. Um, And so that's what we did. My husband Kyle was like, all right, let's do it. So he'd be giving me a shot and we'd be showing people like, okay, here's, you know, different things that we do and um, show them the medicine, show them okay, it's embryo transfer day and and all of the things. And so it was amazing. You know, it really stirred up a lot of questions for people like, Hey, I'm getting ready to go do this. And, and, you know, how did you feel about this medicine or this procedure? And it was um, amazing just to be able to connect with so many people and to, to take away, I think what's scary when you go through IVF the first time is the unknown. Um, And so I was trying to take that away from people. Um, So everybody knew when we transferred and, and everything. And so, you know, we announced right away that we were pregnant and, um, 
I will say I was a hundred percent confident. Um, like why wouldn't I be, you know, Mm -hmm. here we have healthy embryos. I've had a pregnancy. Um, so six days after we announced we were pregnant, I, I miscarried and I, it just complete utter shock and devastation. I mean, just never, it never even crossed my mind really that that would happen. Just, you know, based on what everybody had said, based on the fact that Brexton, everything was perfect with him. And so that was, that was a really hard time. And that was a really um, painful time that I feel like if it wasn't, for the fact that this community is so strong, I could have gotten through Mm -hmm. Uh, by sharing it, even though it was really hard, it was very helpful because so many women reached out who have had a miscarriage and was able to kind of, I like to say like my friends were there for me and they love me completely, but it was too raw. Like I needed Mm -hmm. that space. And I feel like social media gives you, that kind of um, protection to not like, you don't have to sit face to face. You don't have to hug. You don't have to be overly emotional. Cause I, I just felt like, um, like a nerve ending, right? Like it was, it was just all too much. And so that really, that really helped me was all those women. And, and, you know, it, I kind of talk about that in the book and it's something that never, it, it the pain is always there. Like part of your heart's always missing, but I do feel like I've, I'm at peace with what has happened because of kind of the coping techniques that I've learned. And um, like, I have a tattoo to remember mm-hmm. them and we planted a tree in our daughter's honor. And so that was all because of other women being like, here's what I did. Mm-hmm. We're going to take a quick break from this episode to talk about one of my favorite wellness brands, and that is Care of. All of Care Of's products are formulated with good for you, clean ingredients that are backed by science and they make everything so convenient to get in your vitamins and supplements. And what I did, because sometimes I just start taking random vitamins. <laughs> I know that doesn't sound great, but I do. It's like I buy this vitamin over there, then this supplement over there. And then I'm like, what do I really need to be taking? And so they make it quick and easy to go online and you can take their quiz. And it's an in-depth five-minute online quiz that asks you questions about your diet, lifestyle, your health concerns to help address your specific wellness goals. And it's like getting a one-on-one consultation with a nutritionist, all without leaving your house. You get a personally tailored approach to your unique health needs. And as moms, partners, and business owners, women have a lot on their plate. Small routines like drinking a glass of water, taking your vitamins, or adding collagen to your morning coffee can go a long way in helping you prioritize your health, and your self-care. And Care Of helps support you with the ongoing guidance and nutrients tailored to your specific needs. Uh, Like I said, I like it because, first of all, it's all in a pack. So I'm not unscrewing random tops from different bottles to try to get this vitamin here and that one there. Uh, And I was able to go online and and feel confident that I'm taking things that my body needs and um, that I'm just getting that additional nutritional support um, that that I need in my life. Uh, So right now we have a great offer for you guys for 50% off your first care of order Go to care, takecareof.com and enter code MIRACULOUS50. That's takecareof.com and enter code MIRACULOUS50 for 50% off your first care of order. Now back to the episode. So from there, it took us a good year to get in the right mindset again, to try again. Um, and that time we told no one. Mm-hmm just couldn't even imagine having anybody knowing it it was just Kyle and I, it was super private. Um, and that time was really hard again too, because it was odd with Brexton and then our daughter, I didn't feel pregnant in that 12 day wait. Um, and even with her, I guess 
because I had miscarried, I never felt anything like those first six weeks. I didn't feel sick or anything like that. Um, but our third cycle, my boobs hurt. I could smell everything. I just felt like, I was like, oh, I am pregnant, you know, cause I got real bad morning sickness with Brex. Um, probably it was like the fifth, fourth or fifth week. And so this was like, you know, right away. And I was like, this has to be a good sign. Um, and so they called the day 12 and they're like, it, it's a complete failed cycle. And I was like, no, it can't be like, I feel pregnant. And I was like, what, how is it not even taking at all? You know, like what's, what's happening. Um, and out of our embryos, there were, you know, how they grade them with the PSG testing. Mm-mm. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not that well versed on it, but they do the testing and then certain embryos may get to the day five blast. And those are like your, I guess, if you want to say like your super strong embryos, right. Mm-hmm. And then the other ones are viable. Um, and so those three had been like our super strong ones. Um, so they sat down and they're like, okay, um, we feel that there must be something wrong with you. And although we've done panels and all sorts of tests, we're not sure what it is. And so we think you need to use a surrogate. Um, and that, that was a whole nother roller coaster of emotions trying to process and swallow that and then find a surrogate. So that took us an entire another year. Mm-hmm. Um, finally found this amazing woman and did the transfer. And we were so positive because, you know, she, I remember the doctor being like, oh my gosh, her uterus looks great. Her lining looks great. And I was like, yes. And then she had a complete failed cycle. Oh. So we were like, okay, what is happening? So, um, that was just this past November. So from there, we um, decided to go get multiple consults just to figure out, you know, I want to see if all the doctors are going to tell us the same thing or if everybody's going to say something different because, you know, I feel like, again, back when we were trying getting those failed tests, that kind of free falling, that grasping at straws feeling of like, what, what else can we do? Mm -hmm. Um, and so after talking with a number of doctors, they all were led to believe because I'm a proven uterus and our surrogate to proven uterus, having two kids that there must be an embryo issue. And they didn't feel like the other embryos were viable anymore. Which then led us back, uh, in December, January to starting all over. Um, we went with another clinic and, and I would, if I have a second to talk about clinics. Yeah, of okay? course. So a lot of people ask me like why we changed clinics. Cause we love our clinic here in Charlotte and it is hard. Um, it was not an easy decision, but I do think sometimes, you know, we have to be confident to go ahead and try another road in order to say that we've tried everything. And, and that's the reason we went with a different clinic was I just had to know at the end of the day that I tried everything. Um, and so I hear that a lot, you know, from women that are like, Oh, I love my doctor, but I don't love the clinic or I love the clinic, but I don't love my doctor. Like, what do I do? And it is hard and it's awkward. Like I, I, I still with our foundation work super closely with the clinic that I'm no longer at. And I think people always think that the doctors are going to be mad at you. Right. And our doctor was like, I'm not mad at you at all. Like I understand fully why you want to try something else just to say, because all the doctors told us the same thing. Um, he was like, but I get it. And I, I think a lot of doctors are that way. They want you to get second or even third opinions. They, they want you to be confident. And, um, so that it, it took a lot and it was really hard because I feel like our clinic here in Charlotte, they're more like family at this point. Cause mm-hmm. we've been with them for eight years at this point. Um, but I think, you know, we, as women have to, I know it sounds bad, like not worry about hurting other people's feelings. Mm -hmm. Cause that's what I was afraid of. I was like, I don't want them to be mad at me. And they were like, we're not mad at you at all. Like 
it's fine. So I think that was really important. And um, I just went through my last egg retrieval. It went really great. Um, I've since my first egg retrieval in 2014, got a lot more into um, supplements and acupuncture and things on a holistic approach to kind of help with IVF. And I will say, I feel so much better this round. Um, I feel like my mood swings are better. The side effects of all the medications haven't been as bad. So definitely a firm believer in that. Mm -hmm. I love that you shared that because I feel like a lot of people listening kind of feel like you have to do one or the other. And if you're going through infertility, the last thing you want to hear is like, oh, eat this diet or I did this, you know, this holistic thing um, because that's not necessarily a cure-all either. Correct. Yeah. And like I said, I, you know, we haven't done an embryo transfer. I don't know if it will work, but I do know already just an overall feeling. Um, Last time I felt, you know, like I said, I had mood swings. Maybe I didn't have as much energy. Sometimes I was more nauseous. Um, Now I do acupuncture twice a week and I'm on this huge supplement regimen, which I have it on my blog and it came from actually our clinic CCRM. Um, Just a lot of different supplements to take at different times, cutting way back on caffeine, um, you know, doing things to promote blood flow, especially to the uterus and the ovaries and And so I don't know how to work for the actual embryo transfer, but the fact that seven years later, you know, we made more quality embryos, even though I'm seven years older, I feel like that's kind of a testament that kind of the holistic and the scientific way both actually work hand in hand. Um, And I've talked to a lot of women about that who just really feel a lot better doing it. Mm Mm-hmm. We're going to take a quick break from this episode to talk about one of my favorite things growing up, and that was cereal. Uh, For like the first 20 years of my life, I ate cereal a lot. And then you read the label and you realize that it's full of sugar and junk that you shouldn't necessarily eat. But thanks to Magic Spoon, I am able to put cereal back into my diet uh, because they make it good for you. It has lots of protein, 13 to 14 grams of protein, only four grams, net grams of carbs each serving. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. And they are releasing two new amazing flavors. I personally love all the ones they have now. I love the blueberry. I love the frosted, the cocoa, the fruit woods literally tastes like fruity pebbles, but now they are adding cookies and cream and maple waffle. And if that isn't the most comforting, indulgent combination, then I don't know what is. It is the ultimate treat yourself combo. Uh, And it just sounds absolutely amazing. And right now you can go to magicspoon.com slash mamas to grab the new limited edition cookies and cream, maple waffle, or a custom bundle of cereal to try today. And be sure to use our promo code mamas at the checkout to save $5 off your order. This offer is now good anywhere in the US or Canada, but only when you use our code at the checkout. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product and it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of cereal guilt-free at magicspoon.com slash mamas and use code mamas to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Uh, How long were you kind of doing the holistic stuff before this retrieval? So I started when I was talking with different doctors and we went in for a few of our consults. One of the doctors that who we're with now, he mentioned, he was like, Hey, you know, we tell our patients that acupuncture is really good. And there's a supplement regimen. If you want to start on it already, you can. And, and so he was just kind of telling me all those things. And so I started it, you know, well before starting the egg retrieval and just, and you know, it could be a little bit in my head, but I, I would go to the acupuncturist and be like, Oh, kind of feeling nauseous. And, you know, she would put the little metal dots on your pressure points and she would do a few things. And, and there was never a day, like, I felt like when I went through egg retrieval the first time, and I'm sure also in seven years, they've learned different medicine cocktails too, you know what I'm saying? But, um, 
I didn't feel like my energy was zapped or I was sick all day. I, I felt, you know, maybe not totally normal, but it didn't stop me from doing anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You've been through such a journey. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's been a long, <laughs> long eight years. We'll, we'll just say that. Uh, so this time, are you planning on doing the transfer, doing having them trans, do the transfer in you or are you trying to surrogate again? No, um, I'm going to try myself. The doctor was really confident. He, you know, looked at my uterus and he was like, I don't see a reason not to think that you won't be okay. And he also said, you know, if your surrogate had had at least some success besides a complete failed cycle, I would have said, Ooh, maybe it's you. He's like, but given that she's had two healthy children and had a failed cycle, he was like, it it really, and that's what all the doctors said. They were like, we really feel that it has to be an embryo issue, not Mm -hmm. a you issue. So, um, that was exciting. That yeah. was, it took me a minute. I, I remember I was sitting there and he was like, do you want to carry? And I was like, well, yeah, but I spent over a year talking myself out of the fact that I would ever be pregnant again and get to experience that. And so, you know, it was like, wait a second, is this for real? Because if you take this back now, I'm going to be really sad. And he was like, no, we, everything looks great. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, man, that had to have been so exciting. And I feel like that also just kind of gives hope to a lot of people listening because you've been on this journey for eight years and you've kind of tried every single avenue. Uh, So for people listening, you know, there, there is hope. Yeah. I mean, I, I just feel like, you know, it's funny people are like, oh, you know, we're surprised you're so optimistic about this after all you've been through. And I said, well, I am because I feel like going into it with a positive attitude. I feel like I've had so much community support from connecting with people through social media in this infertility world that they've kind of helped me keep going. And then we found an amazing church. And I just think when you do it with a tribe of people behind you, it it makes it easier to go through. And I think the first time we did this, I didn't have that. And, and it was, it was harder. It it was hard too, because I felt like with Kyle, I would just, you know, he was the only one who knew what was happening so in depth that he kind of took, I don't want to say the brunt of all those heavy weighted conversations, but that's kind of what they were where this time if I'm having anxiety or something about it, there's fertility coaches and there's apps and there's mm-hmm. women that you could just DM and be like, Hey girl. So I'm like kind of panicked about this and it just helps me feel better. I think it makes our marriage better. And it, it's really, it, it's crazy that it, it's literally, if you want to think about it, strangers in mm-hmm. this community, but they end up being like your lifeline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Finding, finding that sense of community is so helpful. And I feel like with this last year, a lot of things being shut down, it can be super isolating. Did you have to go to the appointments by yourself? I did. Um, that, that I didn't love (laughs) if I'm being honest. Um, you know, you always want your, your partner there. Um, I think he is allowed in the embryo transfer, which is good. And he was allowed in the recovery after my egg retrieval, but a lot of like the, you know, regular appointments he wasn't allowed in. And, and that was kind of hard, but, you know, since we are traveling, it was kind of nice. We still did it as a team. Like he would, we would go to the appointment together and then he would just wait outside and we'd like go get breakfast or whatever after. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like we've, um, done all this so much as a team. And, and like I said, I really think it's because on a marriage infertility is really weighing, right? It's kind of, I don't want to say the elephant in the room, but the thing that I think as women, we always want to talk about because it's what's on our mind. Right. And that could be really stressful in a marriage when it kind of all encompasses your marriage. And so I think really having a support group of women who understand has made it so that we could go through this together. And I still talk with him about stuff regularly, but it's not that like, I'm not frustrated because he doesn't understand what I'm talking about because I could go talk to, 
you know, one, another girl who knows exactly what I mean and get that support there and then get his support in a different way. And I just feel like it's made our marriage and this whole process so much easier. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that you're meant to get everything from one person. Um, But going through, you know, struggling with infertility, like you said, you might not want to share that with everybody in your life or there might not be people as understanding and like your partner is the one going through it with you. So I could see how that, you'd be like, this is what we're going through. We're going through it together. I need you to reassure me. I need you to like help me with these different, you know, struggles that we're facing uh, and how that could be very weighing. Yeah. And so now it's nice. I mean, obviously, you know, he still gives me my shots and, and he's always there when he needs me. But I think a lot of our tension was me expecting him to kind of give me that support that I was looking for, but he couldn't because he didn't understand it fully like a woman going through it does. And then on his side, you know, he would get frustrated because he felt like it was kind of consuming me. And so now I just feel like we have this really nice balance in our marriage where I can come to him and easily talk about stuff, but because it's not doom and gloom and 24 seven, he's a lot more receptive to it. So just and, you know, um, I've been really open in the book and talking that like we had to do marriage counseling after our miscarriage. And, and I think that's so important. And, you know, I've, I've actually had people text me like, I can't believe you talked about that. And I'm like, I'm not embarrassed. Mm-hmm. Like there is a saying that marriage is work for a reason, mm-hmm. you know, um, marriage isn't what's on Instagram. That's all flowers and puppies and sunshine, right? It's Mm -hmm. sometimes it's really great. And sometimes it's hard, but when you're able to go through therapy, you're able to learn different, even communication skills and different coping mechanisms and just ways to get on the same page together. And I think, especially when you're going through infertility, even if you're not fighting, like if you can go talk to somebody, whether it's a therapist or fertility coach or a support group, like it's so important to just know that you have that tool or that option available to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Tell us about your book. Oh oh my gosh. It's like still so exciting because I've been writing it for so long. Um, I'm really excited. So it's called Fighting Infertility. Um, because I think that's something that, you know, there's a lot of days where you might feel like you want to give up or that it's too hard or it's too much. Um, but it's really been the amazing support of this community. And I see it with so many women that we kind of have each other's back and it's like, all right, keep going. Or like this part of the journey might be hard, but you know, you got it girl, like you're stronger than you think. And so the book is our story, um, incomplete. I've told our story a lot, but it's, very, very detailed, very raw, very candid. Cause I didn't want to sugarcoat anything. Um, I didn't want to paint this picture of like, Oh yeah, it's really easy and you'll be fine. And la la la. I'm like, no, no, no. Here's like the nitty gritty of like what happens to your sex life Mm -hmm. and where all your modesty goes when you are in multiple doctor's appointments and everybody sees everything and a little bit into childbirth of the stuff that they do not tell you. Yeah. I like asked all my friends that had kids. I'm like, what the hell? You could have warned me about some of this. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, it goes through everything. It ends when we decide to try to find a surrogate. So I'm like, I can't believe in the year that I finished, not even a year I finished writing a book, how much has happened. Yeah. Um, but then at the very end is a small, which I hope is a springboard for another book. Um, like advice section where there's members of the infertility community that give their tips. There's therapists that give tips and um, just a nice little guide at the end. If you know about, you know, coping mechanisms or or whatever you you might be dealing with um, kind of tools to help you get through it. And so that would be my goal is to work with a number of other women in this community and coaches and therapists and, and create, you know, almost like a guide, if you will, for women. Um, like I talk about in there, what to say when people are like, how come you're not having a baby? Yeah. Why don't you have kids? Like different things like that or coping with a miscarriage, coping with a failed cycle. So that's what the end of the book is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We've talked a lot on here about those types of questions because 
they're just kind of unnecessary and really nobody's business. And they can be really hurtful for people who are struggling or experience loss or for whatever reason it may be, aren't having kids right now. Um, So I think the community of women and moms just needs to get better at asking better questions. Yes. And also I tell women, um, you don't owe anybody anything. Mm -hmm. So if that coworker that you hardly talk to, like won't stop asking you, like it's like, it's completely fine to politely say, I'm sorry, that's a private matter. And I don't feel like discussing it. Like Mm -hmm. you don't owe somebody an answer that you're not ready to give. And, you know, I always say, now looking back on it during my third cycle, when we didn't tell anybody, I felt almost like a hypocrite. Cause here I am like telling everybody, like, talk about it, share your story, build this community. But now I realize if you need to protect your mental health, that has to come first. So if you're not ready to share, even with your closest family and friends, like you have to make that decision when that time is right. And you have to decide how you want to tell your story. If you want to tell it, um, But the only thing I say about that is there's so many anonymous support groups where you can be unidentified, but still get that support that you need. So it's like, if you don't want to share your story publicly or with friends or family, totally fine, but at least try to find that support because I, I don't feel like going through this alone is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Can you share a couple names of support groups? Yeah. So Fab Fertility has one, um, the one in four app, there's peanut app, there's um, the resolve. They have even like local meetup chapters. There's ones through a lot of people's churches. Um, And then for me, just, you know, Googling hashtags like IVF community, infertility warriors, infertility sisters. And then you just start finding other women that openly talk about their journey and you can look at them or their comments and, and just DM someone and, you know, be like, Hey, I, I might be getting ready to go through this. I see you've went through it. Any advice, any help? Um, I just feel like this community is so ready and willing to help other people on their journeys that you should never, you know, be worried to reach out. And, and so that's what I find is the best way to connect with people. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've been such a help and you're so open sharing your story. I can't even imagine like the amount of people that have reached out to you. Like your community must be like so solid. It's amazing. And so because I'm so blessed to have a big community of supporters, what I try to do is like, for example, after this last egg retrieval, it was vastly different than my first one. And I couldn't figure out why, like I just had so much pressure and stuff. And so I went on and I did an Instagram story, like question. I was like, guys, what can I do? Like, I am dying. My stomach hurts so bad. And instantly there was all these people that were like canned soup, Gatorade, you know, uh, juices, all like, um, the ones like spinach, kale, you Mm -hmm. know, the gross juices. Right. Um, and they're like, drink all this, force yourself to have Gatorade and, and lots of salt. I'm like, Oh, okay. And instantly, like by 24 hours later, I felt better. And so I tried to take all their comments and put them in more Instagram stories and push it out there so that other women could have that knowledge too. Um, because you know, even in recovery, my nurse was great, but she was like, Oh, you know, salty foods are your friend. I'm like still groggy from anesthesia and pain meds. And I'm like, "Uh Mm uh-huh. Didn't really listen. And, but this infertility community, they've been there. So Mm -hmm. they're like, no, 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 specifically get canned soup, specifically get Gatorade, put a heating pad on, do this, um, get laxatives. Here's the best laxatives, you know? And so I just feel like that peer to peer, yeah. Peer to peer support is so valuable during this. I I can't even stress that enough. Mm Mm-hmm. Wow. Man, you've been through so much. Oh my gosh. You know what? I look at it like, and it's funny because people are like, how are you smiling? I'm like, I know that God put me on this journey for a reason. Um, and if, if we hadn't been on this journey, we wouldn't have obviously had Brexit. Um, but from the struggles, we wouldn't have the bundle joy fund because we wouldn't have understood the finances that go into IVF. If we hadn't gone through a miscarriage, I wouldn't have been able to connect with other women and help voice that, you know, side of infertility. If we hadn't gone through all the failed cycles, I wouldn't understand what it was like trying to find a surrogate. And so I just know that 
it was a lot of hard trials, but I'm able to turn around and look at all the good that's come from it. So that's, that's been a really big blessing. And I think what helps like keep a grateful attitude, no matter what's next. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Cause there's always little things. And that's what I should tell people. There's always little hurdles that pop up, like right before egg retrieval, two days before, was it? No, a week before. Cause we were flying out. They're like, Hey, we did your scan. You um, have some pal uh, like, cysts in your ovaries that we have to get rid of or else we can't go through egg retrieval and I'm like are you kidding me I have to go through two surgeries in one week and they're like yeah sorry here you go and you're like okay all right here we go mm -hmm. um but I don't know I just just keep going yeah tell us about the bundle of joy fund yeah sorry there is a little okay um, the Bundle of Joy Fund is amazing. I'm so proud of it. We um, have now helped 70 couples. We have 36 babies born. There's a baby born two weeks ago. Oh, that's so uh, fun. Oh, it's so fun. Um, there's six more on the way already this year, and we are closing in on the million dollar mark. So we are super excited. And our goal is eventually, um, we're right here at the Charlotte clinic right now, but my goal is to go nationwide with the application and be able to help women all over the country. Mm -hmm. So women basically apply because they need the financial assistance for IVF. Yeah. yeah. It's a need-based assist assistant grant. And, um, you know, I love being able to have the foundation local because I get to meet the moms and meet the kids and all those things. Um, but I do recognize that there's such a need across the country because insurance does not do its part mm -hmm. in fertility. Um, so we're hoping to be able to go nationwide and, and be able to help more people. And I think if COVID has taught us anything, COVID taught us that you could do everything via Zoom and <laughs> even though I miss and I love that in-person meetings because you could like visibly see a weight lifted off their shoulders when you tell them they have a grant. Um, I mean, I just feel like technology in the last year has come so much farther. So mm -hmm. we'll still make it work. That's so amazing. That's so amazing that, that you guys are able to do that. Like you're saying, kind of everything that you've been through, you're just turning it into this well, first of all, like your story and your book and sharing that information and community and then helping these other couples get through it. So you guys are almost like adoptive parents to all these babies being born. <laughs> the coolest thing is watching my son play with our Bundle Joy Fun kids. Oh, how fun. It's like totally full circle. Um, and it's really, really special. Mm -hmm. How old's your son now? Five and a half. Five and a half. Yes. Very he's, cool. Uh, he is very much ready for a sibling. That has been his request for over three years now. Does is he? Um, does he have kind of any idea of what's going on or not really? Oh, no. We were very open and honest with him from the beginning. Um, you know, from how mommy and daddy needed help from the doctors to have him and then with his sister and then with the miscarriage and, and the failed cycles and the surrogate. Like we've in five-year-old terms right. have explained everything to him all along the way. So we joke that like one day in school, when they do like the birds and the bees talk, he's going to be like, that's not how it happened <laughs> at all. He's like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's like a lot of doctors and nurses and shots. He's going to be really confused by that whole talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm always amazed at the strength of people going through IVF because like, like you said, the shots, like all of the treatments that you have to do, it's not like, I guess when I first heard about what IVF was years ago, I'm like, oh, so basically you do an egg retrieval, you know, they make an embryo, then they put it in you. It's, but there's so much more than that. It's a, tons of appointments. It's tons of money. It's taking, you know, getting these shots and getting all this, you know, timing and everything right. And it's, I mean, it's, a really big commitment. And obviously it's something that you really want. Yeah. I mean, there's a ton that goes into it. Um, and that's what I like to tell people, like anybody going through infertility, like you are such a badass. Mm -hmm. And because if you look at it, you're like, wow, I got through this. I got through this. I got through this. And I think it just really puts, and I called it fighting infertility. And I say like, you know, like you're a warrior because 
that's how you really feel like when you turn around, regardless of what happened with your cycle, like you still endured, like you said, all those appointments, all those medications, all those shots, all these things. And I just feel like you grow and become so much stronger from it because when we first started, there is literally, it's super embarrassing, but a YouTube video and it was our first night of shots and I'm hysterically sobbing, like needles, not even near me crying. Like I'm sure toddlers do when they go for their appointments. Right. And I'm like, I'm not doing it. I quit. Never mind. And then you get through it and you're like, okay, I mean, it wasn't fun, but I did it. And now this time around, my husband's like, wow, you are a lot easier. I'm like, well, it's not that the shots are easier. You just know that you can do it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, everybody who's going through infertility is such a badass. And it's really, I mean, we really do have to fight to try to get insurance companies to cover it because, um, don't get me started. (laughs) (laughs) Well, infertility, I mean, it's a disease and you know, if you have other diseases, they're usually covered. (laughs) Okay. So I called our insurance because I have to go get an ultrasound. Um, so we're traveling for the races, like in between our embryo transfer. So when we're in Phoenix, I have to go for a lining check. And so they sent me this note and they're like, Hey, just so you know, for the ultrasound in the labs, because your insurance you know, policy doesn't cover IVF, your office visit is going to be $690. Oh my gosh. And I was like, I mean, what, what, you can't say no, right? Like you have to go. So I called their insurance company. I was like, yeah, is Viagra covered? And they're like, well, yeah. And I'm like, cool. So it's an elective for me to have a child because my ovaries don't work. But that's not an elective. Right. It's not oh. an elective to get a boner. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm sorry. Um, definitely older males make up our policies. Oh my gosh. I, we need some girls in there to be like, look, I said this one day and this lady was like, oh, that's, that's not wrong. Cause she, she was kind of arguing with me that it shouldn't be covered because, and I, it's like such a trigger word when people say it's an elective to be a parent. Hmm. And so I told her, I said, if you got in a car accident and broke your leg, do you go to the doctor? And she's like, well, of course. And I was like, cool. Well, technically you could make it through life with one leg. So you are electively choosing to get that leg fixed. And she was like, well, it's different. And I was like, no, it's one body part versus another body part. Like you can't pick and choose because ovaries are, you know, a reproductive organ that they're not as important as like a thumb or what. I'm like, how do you get to pick which body part is more important? I just, sorry, it's my ramble soapbox of how people can justify everything, but infertility is still looked at. I mean, I feel like sometimes like we're, we're back in the fifties, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's women's health. It's reproductive health. Like how are we still fighting? Why are we still asking couples to pay 20, 30, 40, $50,000 to become parents. Mm -hmm. It's absurd. Mm -hmm. No, sorry. No, don't apologize. I'm like over here being like, yes, yes, yes. I get so upset about it. And my husband always laughs because he's like, okay, if you ever get in front of like policymakers one day, you have to tone it down because he was like, you go off. And I'm like, maybe follow a script, you know, (laughs) sound a little bit more professional because I get pissed about it. Cause I'm like, I sit here and help fund couples that are, you know, working five jobs together. They're Mm -hmm. like literally budgeting everything. They're moving in with their parents and Oh yeah, by the way, they're nurses, teachers, police officers, like amazing citizens that help other people. And then when they want to become parents, our insurance policies are like, hmm, sorry, it's an elective. No, thanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think that if, uh, if male factored infertility was more talked about, it actually might be more covered because I feel like when it just comes to women, a lot of things aren't, um, even, you know, maternity leave, our country is really horrible with that. So uh, we don't do a really good job at supporting moms in our society. And that goes for women who are already moms in their heart and trying to become them. Oh, completely. I mean, I just think 
you know, we've come so far in other areas and even in the world of IVF, from a scientific standpoint, we've come so far. But like you said, when it comes to women's health, it's going to take people having a loud voice and standing up and saying this isn't right. You know what I mean? And and I actually just had a meeting today. Not only is it not right about the cost, but just different underrepresented communities that aren't even getting the facts or Hmm. access to treatments. It's not right. And, and there has to be a major shift in our healthcare and our way that we view, like you said, women's health to see that difference. I mean, I know there's strides and other things, but I feel like when it comes to fertility, we're just still so far behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why I love talking with people like you, because I feel like I learned a lot today. I mean, I, I'm not very well versed in infertility at all. And I loved hearing your story and listening to, I mean, you were so open and shared so much. So I feel like I learned a lot. So those are things I can carry on into other conversations that I have as well. Um, You know, and you never know like who, who you meet or who who you end up having a conversation with. And, you know, but I mean, it is people like you who are having meetings and talking about trying to actually get change and setting up grants for couples who need it um, that are really going to make the difference. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's, that is my goal. Um, You know, we're hoping here that this transfer goes well and, you know, not to say that it closes the book on it, but I'm hoping, you know, to complete our family and then pass there, obviously growing the foundation. And then I really want to start working. There's a lot of amazing groups of women out there that are the reason that there's, you know, coverage in different states or even different cities. It's taken women banding together, using their voice and getting policies changed. And so that would probably in the next few years, um, you know, once I learn to tone my emotions down, (laughs) because I can't go to a meeting and be like, this is bullshit, right? (laughs) Once I uh, hone that in and, 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 you know, really gather, it's just, I'm so passionate about it because I read so many applications of people that would become wonderful parents, or I meet people that just don't even have the knowledge about it because it was never presented to them. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's so frustrating and it's so heartbreaking. Um, And so that would future goals. Yeah. Well, we're excited to see what all you do and to follow your journey. Um, I mean, now I feel like I'm invested in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Our embryo transfers in a few weeks. Um, so I'll give you this little piece too. Um, we obviously have had to come to terms with a lot of stuff and, and, you know, like people like, okay, we'll have a boy and a girl and, you know, our girls didn't work. And then, the other ones were boys and they weren't viable. And so when we did this again, they were like, well, you know, you'll probably be close to 50, 50 split. Cause that's how you were last time. And I was like, okay. And my husband's like, well, what happens if we have all boys? And I was like, well, then as much as I want a girl to dress in all pink and glitter and leopard, like God's going to tell me I'm going to be a boy mom and I'm going to be at a racetrack for the rest of my life. Like I get it. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I was like, okay you know, just another thing, kind of like with the surrogacy, like, okay, it'll be fine. Like, cause I'm as girly as they come and you have no idea. (laughs) And you have a little boy like driving around in race cars already. Yes. And like, does all like the farting and the burping and it's like having, you know, I have like just all the boy stuff I'm always. And so, but my husband's like, you know, you need to come to terms with the fact. And I was like, I know. And like, it'll be fine. Right. Like, Mm -hmm. it'll be fine. I'll be a crazy boy mom and I'll love every minute of it. And Mm -hmm. it'll be great. And, um, so the nurse called the other day and she was like, you had five embryos. So we had nine viable, but five were like the day five, the the really good ones. And she was like, do you want to know the gender? And so we're like, yes. And she kind of paused and I'm like, oh no, (laughs) why are you pausing? And she was like, I really hope you want a girl because they're all Ah! girls. And I was like, (laughs) And I was just so excited. And I was literally was 
hysterically screaming in the car. And she even said the um, other four embryos, which are still viable, she said uh, the other three tested fine. And she goes, the one, uh, the ninth one who was a boy, we couldn't get a read on him. So what, like, we'd have to go retest and all this stuff. And I was like, she goes, oh my gosh, like, it's not very normal to have so many, or, you know, like one way. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. So yeah. And my husband's like, please be cautiously optimistic. Like we've been here before. Yeah. And I'm like, it's like, oh, F that. Like I already got my target <laughs> part packed with dresses and bikinis. Like she got like her little mermaid bathing suit. And he was like, okay, then. Like I yeah. just, I mean, that has to be the hard part too, though, is like, you still have to allow yourself, it's like, you want to be cautious, but you have to allow yourself to be excited too. I, I think, I don't know. I'm a very emotional person. I know that it's probably, like you said, easier, you know, like with the surrogate in the last cycle to kind of, Kyle always says like, check your emotions, like don't get too invested. And I don't, I, that's not me. And that's not how I'm going to live. I'm like either all in. So Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like I have her nursery prepared. I have clothes. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. so he's like, just, just don't get too out of yourself. I'm like, okay. Right. Like, you You're like, I'm me. past myself. I <laughs> <laughs> like, have everything picked out. I mean, in my defense, I've had like three and a half years to get right. ready. So right. yeah. And um, I feel like that's just something like when you want kids that you start to do, like I started making a Pinterest nursery board way before we even talked about like trying to conceive oh completely I mean so many boards and I just I don't know I'm like there's I'll never be that person who doesn't go into it like full-heartedly so I don't know I'm super excited and and I think you know I'm just I said I I feel like I can keep fighting and I can keep doing this because I'm just so grateful and blessed to even be able to keep doing this because I've met so many couples that the finances are in the way and, and it breaks my heart. And that's why we're going to keep growing the foundation. Mm-hmm. I've added three events already this year from last year, like awesome. virtual and all those things. Um, and we're going to keep doing it. And then mm-hmm. one day we'll talk again when we get some policies. Yeah. Going. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I just want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and your time and just all the amazing work that you're doing and your book. Make sure everybody listening that you that you buy that. It like just came out or it's just coming out? It comes out March 30th. Okay. That's right. That's right. Um, which April is Fertility Awareness Month. Yes. Yep, so yep, did you plan yep. that? Um, actually, no. And this is what I'm telling you. Like, I always feel like God's timing comes into play. And so that worked out perfect. Um, and we're super excited. I do want to, if it's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, we're doing an in-person and virtual infertility summit, which you can find out about on the Bundle of Joy Fund. And I'm really excited because we're going to have a panel of experts from like embryologists to doctors to, um, just people, in the community who've been through this. And so There's a really good learning opportunity if you're getting ready to go through IVF or if you're in the middle of it, um, just to educate yourself about all aspects of the process and things that, you know, if you're virtual, you can do it anonymously. So if you have a question that you're like, oh, I'm embarrassed or I'm uncomfortable talking about, like send it in because I'll sure as heck ask. I don't don't have much of a filter. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, So where can people find and follow you at? Yeah. So my handles are all at Samantha Bush, Bush is B-U-S-C-H. Um, and then the Bundle of Joy Fund is bundlejoyfund.org. Awesome. Thank you again so much for coming on. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was oh, it was so great talking with her. She She's very inspirational. After I ended the recording, we went on and talked a little bit longer and I should have just kept it rolling because we talked a lot, dove a lot deeper about legislat- legislature and like what's how it's affecting minority communities, even with access to fertility and people not getting options. Uh, and she's just doing so much in her area and she wants to explain, expand it, uh, you know, throughout the United States. So make sure you go and support her, follow her, check out her book. You can also, um, look at her grant program. If you want to check that out as well, it's called the bundle of joy fund.org. Uh, and you can even apply for a grant if you want to there, uh, donate, spread the word, help other couples 
become parents. So, um, yeah, she was just, I, I love talking to these women that are like doing so much. Like she's not just talking about wanting to change things. She's actually taking steps toward it. And it's very motivating for me because there's a lot of things I want to change. So many people don't have access to what they need. Uh, and instead of talking about it, I just need to be more active. I need to do something. I need to get more involved with my local community. I need to talk to local representatives and try to figure out ways for people to have, for moms to have the support that they need, uh, which just is lacking and it, and it isn't there. So she's definitely inspirational and empowering. And I had such an amazing time chatting with her. All right, guys, enjoy your Easter weekend and we will talk to you next week. Love you. Bye. If you want to be the most interesting person at the cocktail party, well, hop on over and listen to the Brain Candy Podcast. Our award-winning content will have you laughing while you're learning. We read all the best articles, books, and studies and keep up with new TV shows, documentaries, and pop culture. And then we cram it all into two shows a week. Conspiracy theories, cannibal rabbits, unsolved mysteries, the history of the Walkman. There's something for everyone. The Brain Candy Podcast. Find our link in the show notes. Or simply search for the Brain Candy Podcast on your podcast app.